Chapter 3 Examine on Humility Toward God Section 102 The first act of humility, says St. Thomas, consists in rendering ourselves entirely subject to God, with the greatest reverence for His infinite majesty, before which we are as nothing. All nations are before Him as if they had no being at all. Isaiah 40, 17 But do you ever consider your nothingness before God, and that all the being you have you have from God, and that through intrinsic necessity you depend so entirely upon God that without Him you cannot do anything good. For without me you can do nothing. John 15.5 That without God you neither think nor say nor do anything that is good. This is de fide, of faith, that is, required to be believed. No man can say the Lord Jesus, but by the Holy Ghost. 1 Corinthians 12, 3 Not that we are sufficient to think anything of ourselves as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. 2 Corinthians 3, 5 For it is God who worketh in you, both to will and to accomplish, according to his good will. Philippians 2, 13 it is not enough only to say, I know all these things, but it is necessary to realize them in order to become really humble. The angelic doctor teaches that the reason why humility tends principally to render the soul subject to God is that this virtue is nearest to the theological virtues, and as it does not suffice only to know what things we must believe or hope, but it is also necessary for us to make acts of faith and hope so in the same way we must make like acts of humility. Christ himself taught humility of heart, and the heart must not remain idle, nor fail to produce the necessary acts. And what acts of humility do you make before God? How often do you make them? When have you made them? How long is it since you made them? It would be absurd to hope for the reward which is promised to the humble without being humble, or at least without the desire to be humble, and without making acts of humility. Humility of heart without the heart's humbling itself? What folly! And are you foolish enough to believe that this can be done? Sometimes you give utterance to certain words which seem to tend to your own humiliation. You say you are a contemptible wretch and good for nothing. But do you say such things sincerely from your heart? If you are afraid of lying to yourself by confirming them in your own mind, listen to what St. Thomas tells us for our instruction, that everyone can truthfully say and believe of himself that he is a contemptible wretch, referring all his ability and talent to God. 103. But how are we to make these practical acts of humility before God? I will give you some examples. You can imagine yourself in the presence of God, now as a convicted felon who humbles himself and implores mercy for the forgiveness of his sins. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy great mercy. Psalm 50, 1 Now, as a miserable, needy beggar who humbles himself and asks alms to help him in his necessity, give us this day our daily bread. Now, as the sick man near the pool of Bethsaida, who humbled himself before the Savior to be healed of his incurable disease, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pond. John 5.7 Now, as that blind man who humbled himself 
that his darkness might be illuminated. Lord, that I may see. Now, as the Canaanite woman who humbled herself and exclaimed, Have mercy on me, O Lord. Help me. Matthew fifteen twenty two through 25 And who is not ashamed to liken herself to the dogs who are unworthy to eat their master's bread, but are content to eat the crumbs that fall from his table. Humility of heart is ingenuous, and in the same manner as our heart loves without needing to be taught to love, it humbles itself without needing to be taught humility. 104. There are certain cases in which we are obliged to make acts of virtue, such as faith, hope, and charity, which some necessity, circumstance, or duty of our state of life may exact, and there are certain cases in which we must make acts of humility in our hearts. First of all, it is necessary to humble ourselves when we approach God with prayer to obtain some grace, because God does not regard nor heed nor impart his grace except to the humble. The Lord is high and looketh on the low. Psalm 137, 6. The prayer of the humble and the meek hath always pleased thee. Judith 9, 16. God giveth grace to the humble. James 4, 6. When, therefore, you come to ask God for some grace of the body or of the soul, do you always remember to practice this humility? When we pray, and especially when we say the Our Father, we are speaking to God. And how many times when you are saying your prayers do you speak to God with less respect than if you were speaking to one of your fellow creatures? How often when you are in church, which is the house of God, do you listen to a sermon, which is the word of God, and assist at the functions of the service without any reverence? Humility of heart, says St. Thomas, is accompanied by exterior reverence, and to be lacking in this is to lack humility, and is therefore a sin of pride, which excludes reverence. 105. But the more essential for us is the grace that we are asking of God, the more necessary is humility. However, before going to the tribunal of penance, do you humble yourself and ask God to give you that sorrow for your sins which is necessary for the validity of the sacrament? And as this sorrow must be supernatural, it is certain that you could never attain to it of yourself, however much you were to try to force yourself to feel it. God alone can give it to you. And it is equally certain that this is not a debt which he owes you, but a great grace which it pleases him to confer upon you out of his goodness alone and without any merit on your part. If, however, you desire to receive this grace, you must ask for it with humility, protesting from your heart that you do not deserve it, that you are unworthy to receive it, and that you only hope for it through the merits of Jesus Christ. But do you practice this humility, which one may say is of precept, commandment, for you? because it is an essential means of obtaining contrition? 106. The same can be said of your resolutions, which are equally necessary to render the confession valid. These resolutions must be constant and efficacious, but cannot be so without the special help of God. Do you ever think of humbling yourself and asking for that help? knowing and confessing your instability and weakness, and that you are not capable of yourself 
to keep the smallest resolution, either from morning till night, or even from one hour to another. It is for this reason that you so often fall over and over again into the same faults, because you are lacking in humility. The truly humble man is altogether mistrustful about himself and, putting all his trust in God, is helped in the most admirable way by him. Humble thyself to God and wait for his hands. Ecclesiasticus 13.9 How many times do you not say, I have taken this firm resolution and I mean to keep it. I'm not afraid of breaking it. Trusting iniquitously in yourself without acknowledging the divine health in any way. Take care that you may not be counted among those reprobates who were destroyed, trusting to their own strength. Ecclesiasticus 16.8 If you even presume only a little upon yourself, that little can be the cause of great ruin, according to the prediction of Job. They are lifted up for a little while and shall not stand, and shall be brought down. Job 24, 24. 107. And how do you practice humility in your sacramental confession? It is in your confession that you should humble yourself like a guilty malefactor in the presence of your judge. Humble thy soul to the ancient. Ecclesiasticus 4.7 This advice comes from the Holy Ghost. How often do you not try to appear innocent in the very act of accusing yourself of guilt? Now by excusing your sins, now by covering or diminishing their malice, now by putting the blame on others instead of taking it yourself. This is a real lack of humility, and of that humility which is not of counsel but of precept. You should say with David, I said I will confess against myself my injustice to the Lord. Psalm 31.5 The shame which prevents you from confessing your sin clearly and plainly comes from pride alone. 108. There are some people who, under the pretext of making acts of humility, desire from time to time to accuse themselves in their confession of some grave and shameful sin of their past life. If perhaps you are among these, beware lest this arise more from a desire to appear humble than to be humble in reality. Self-love is cunning and knows how to work secretly. This fault was discovered by St. Bernard, saying, The more subtly vain confession is, the more dangerously hurtful it is, as when, for instance, we are not ashamed to reveal our shameful deeds, not because we are humble, but that we may seem to be so. What is more perverse or shameful than that confession, the guardian of humility? should take service under the banner of pride. This kind of humility is not always desirable, even outside the confessional, because it can easily lead us to create scandal by speaking of certain sins which should not even be named. If you have this strange fault, there is no reason why you should pride yourself on it, but you should rather be ashamed of it for as the holy abbot St. Bernard says, What species of pride can this be, that you would gladly seem to be better by what you appear to be worse, that you cannot be thought holy without seeming to be wicked? 109. And also, after confession, you must remember the sins you have committed in order to excite your heart to feelings of shame and sorrow humbling yourself before God. But do you remember to exercise yourself in this humility? This is a humility of precept, of commandment. 
The whole life of the Christian must be one long penance. Thus speaks the Holy Council of Trent, where the whole Church of Christ was assembled and its dogmas are infallible, not less in matters of morality than in those of faith. The Council of Trent says, must be, which is a formula, not of exhortation, but of necessity. And it does not prescribe such penances as scourgings, hair shirts, or fasts, but speaks generally. And we cannot interpret the sense of these words with more discretion than by saying, if you cannot perform certain exterior penances, you must nevertheless never neglect those interior penances which consist in the contrition and humiliation of the heart, saying with David, Have mercy upon me, O God. Against thee only have I sinned. A contrite and a humbled heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Psalm fifty nineteen. Do you practice this penitential humility? O oh, my God, your sins are so numerous, and yet you live in absolute forgetfulness of them, as if you were innocent. Be not without fear about sin forgiven, and add not sin upon sin, and say not, The mercy of the Lord is great. He will have mercy on the multitude of my sins. Ecclesiasticus 5, 5, 6. Do you remember the obligation you are under to think often? What have I done? What great evil have I done to offend God? Pray to God that he may give you light to know the gravity of your sins, and you will have that continual sorrow which King David had, if you can say with him, I acknowledge my iniquities. 110. Your own faith can teach you how necessary humility is in order that you should approach Holy Communion worthily. But in your preparation for that divine sacrament, and in your thanksgiving, do you make due acts of humility? It is true that you kneel down in all exterior humility and beat your breast at the Domine non sum dignus. But have you really that true humility of heart which is becoming to such a holy function? The centurion was sanctified when he received Jesus Christ into his own house because he prepared himself with deep humility to receive him and said, more from his heart than with his lips, Domine non sum dignus uduntres sub tectum meum. Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldst enter under my roof. Matthew 8, 8. This mystery, more than others, calls for humility. And when the Son of God took flesh in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary, it was especially by virtue of her humility, because he hath regarded the humility of his handmaid. Luke one forty eight. Oh, if you were to reflect that it is God you are going to receive. But do you think of this as God himself exhorts you to do? Be still and see that I am God. Psalm 45.11 111. How do you humble your intellect in regard to the mysteries of the Catholic faith? Are you curious in seeking and wishing to know the reasons for those things which the Church proposes for your belief, inclining to surrender yourself more to human reasoning than to divine authority? In matters of faith, it is most necessary to practice humility. And the more humble our belief, the more honor it gives to God. It is for this reason that Holy Writ, after having said that God is honored by the humble, exhorts us emphatically to humble our intellect. He is honored by the humble. Seek not the things that are too high for thee, and search not into things which are above thy ability. But the things that God hath commanded thee, Think on them always, and in many of his works be not curious. Ecclesiasticus 3.22 When it is a question of faith, 
The Apostle teaches us that we must not seek to know the why and wherefore, but to humble any height of our understanding in lowly reverence to Jesus Christ, bringing into captivity every understanding unto the obedience of Christ. 2 Corinthians 10.5 This is most necessary, and especially when we have temptations against faith. It is necessary that we should humble ourselves immediately, without entering into argument or dispute with the devil. But are you prudent in taking these measures at once? And do you say with King David, I will not pause to consider these speculations in great matters, nor in wonderful things above me. Psalm 132 112 but if we are bound to humble our intellect in the things that touch our belief, we must not humble our will the less in order to do those things which are commanded of us. In this, the substance of true humility principally consists. But how do you observe it? Do you humble yourself promptly in obedience to the divine commandments, persuaded that you are placed in this world only to do the will of God? and not your own? When you recite the Our Father, what thought do you give to these words? Thy will be done. How often do you say them only with your lips, and not from your heart? 113. When you attempt to disobey any of the divine commandments, how do you behave? It is especially in the time of temptation that humility is necessary. Every time the devil tempts you to commit some grave sin, he tempts you to revolt against God and to despise and defend him. 114. How do you resign your will to the will of God in the time of adversity, which is especially the time when we ought to humble ourselves, as the Holy Ghost tells us by the mouth of St. Peter? Be thou humbled, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. 1 Peter 5.6 As all the troubles of this world are ordained by God, and yours are sent to you by him especially to humble your pride, and keep you in due humility? Do you really receive them with such intention as to correspond with the intention of God, saying with the prophet, It is good for me that thou hast humbled me? Psalm 118.71 The best means to oblige God to deliver us from our troubles is to humble ourselves. And in Psalm 114, King David testifies to this by his own experience. I met with trouble and sorrow. I was humbled, and he delivered me. Do you ever practice this means of humbling yourself in your troubles? Protesting that you have merited them and deserve them, if for no other reason than on account of your pride? God sends adversity to you to humble you, and he humbles you, so that from this humiliation you may learn humility. But what fruit of humility have you gathered from all the adversity you have hitherto had? Can you say, as Moses said to the Hebrews, We have rejoiced for the days in which thou hast humbled us. Psalm eighty-nine, fifteen. 115. If you have any good quality, either physical or spiritual, and if you have done any good work, do you recognize that it all comes from God, attributing all the glory to God, as due to Him alone? To the only God be honor and glory. 1 Timothy 1.17 in this, says St. Paul, we discern the Spirit of God, which is the spirit of humility, 
from the spirit of the world, which is the spirit of pride. Because whoever has the spirit of God acknowledges that all that he has is simply a gift from God. Now we have received not the spirit of this world, but the spirit that is of God, that we may know the things that are given us from God. 1 Corinthians 2, 12. But of what use would this recognition be, that everything comes from God, except to refer all things to him and to thank him? Do you thank God for the many blessings which you are constantly receiving from him? from your very heart, with true humility, believing yourself to be so miserable that you would fall into every sin and even into hell itself if God did not come to your help? Unless the Lord had been my helper, my soul had almost dwelt in hell. Psalm 93, 17. 116. Nothing is so contrary to true humility as to seek one's own esteem in the exercise of good works. Do you sometimes do good from motives of human respect, in order to be seen, to be esteemed? Take heed, Christ says to you, that you do not your justice before men, to be seen by them. Matthew 6, 1 you are merely robbing God of glory, when from the gifts he has given you, you reserve some of the glory for yourself. Examine your intentions. Are they purely directed to the glorification of God? And granted that in doing good you do not seek the esteem of men, do you sometimes do this in order not to lose the good graces and favors of others, conforming to their spirit? which is to live according to the usage of the world in the forgetfulness of God? This is also loving the glory of the world more than the glory of God, and is a fault which is greatly opposed to humility, and which was condemned in those chief men among the Jews who believed in Christ. But from fear of the Pharisees and out of respect to their opinion, did not dare to confess him. For they loved the glory of men more than the glory of God. John 12, 43. 117. Have you perhaps a conscience which is fearful by reason of many scruples? If such be the case, examine yourself, and you will probably find that the true reason for your scruples lies in your self-love. That is, in your pride. You are indocile, unteachable, and you do not know how to submit to that which your directors tell you to do. And St. Thomas teaches that this is an effect of pride, because docility is the beautiful daughter of humility and disposes the soul to obedience. How is it, when we read the lives of the saints, we do not find that they were agitated by these scruples. The saints were humble, and where humility is, there also is tranquility of mind. We know that many scrupulous persons have been cured of their scruples, which were considered almost incurable, by no other means than by saying to God with their whole heart, I accuse myself of pride. I am sorry for my pride, and I ask thy help in order to amend my great pride. But if you find that you are scrupulous less from indocility than from cowardice, go for advice once more to St. Thomas, who teaches that this cowardice also comes from pride, because in judging one's own sufficiency, we set our judgment in opposition to that of others. Do you wish to enjoy the peace of a quiet conscience and also of certain spiritual consolations, which are a great help in aiding you to do willingly all that is necessary to lead a devout life and to be ever more fervent in the service of God? I cannot give you better advice than this. 
Give yourself to humility, and God will fill your soul with ineffable consolation. And my spirit hath rejoiced, says the Blessed Virgin in her canticle. And she adds for your instruction that this exaltation was sent to her by God because of her humility, because he hath regarded the humility of his handmaid. Luke 148. 118. If you have a sincere wish to save your soul, you must take those means which God has ordained for you. And the principal and most essential one is humility, as is shown in Holy Scripture. For thou wilt save the humble people. Psalm 1728. And he will save the humble of spirit. Psalm 3319. Glory shall uphold the humble of spirit. Proverbs 29.23 And how do you esteem this humility? How do you practice it? How fervently do you ask God for it? Do you hold it to be of precept, command, or only of counsel, advice, which you are at liberty to choose or reject at will? The entrance to paradise is not only narrow, but low. Therefore, Jesus Christ said, Unless you become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 18.3 And into this kingdom he alone can enter, who shall humble himself. Matthew 18.4 There is always danger on the journey toward our heavenly home for those who hold their heads high, and it is safer to keep them bowed low. This is a general rule for all. St. John Chrysostom warns us when our Lord said, Learn of me, because I am meek and humble of heart. It was not merely to monks that he spoke, but to all classes of men. Humility of heart was not commanded by Jesus Christ only to religious, but also to seculars, whoever they may be, and without any exception.